And I believe that what we're doing here is not only historic, but actually will impact the history of humanity on this planet. I don't think that it's just historic. I think that what we're doing is going to influence the existential future of humans. Because I think that the kinds of technology that we and Google are working on um, are very important for resolving some of the big problems that are going to face humanity over the next few years. So think back to that decision that you made. and Think about maybe having made a different one. So just ask yourself the question, what is, let's say you had made that other decision. Is that person that did that other thing, how real are they? So you have a memory of this thing that you did, and probably everybody involved in that will remember it the same way. And uh, just imagine if you made a different decision, what does that mean? So physics, in our usual sense of the word, you know, balls rolling down the hills and so on, says that that other thing is, is a path not taken. It never happened. It's not real except as some kind of supposition in your brain. But quantum physics, which is somehow more fundamental than this notion that we hold, and is being very successful in explaining the world, says something very different. It opens up the possibility that all of those paths not taken are just as real as the one that you remember. And they exist in some sense. They're real, just like what you remember. And maybe, if we, our technology advances sufficiently far, we can not only know that, but we can use those other resources to influence the behavior of the machines that we make. So quantum computing, in one way of looking at things, is nothing less than going in and touching the deepest fabric of space-time, and with our brains and our technology and our tools, sticking our fingers in the guts of reality and just kneading the hell out of it and making it do what we want. To use these different parallel possibilities to our computational benefit. Uh, now, if you're a physicist or somebody who studies, who is interested in things like what the fabric of space-time is made out of and things of this sort, this is an absolutely fascinating thing that you can commit your career to study, and people do. Now, this doesn't come for free. This kind of exploration is very dangerous in a couple senses. So one, if you're a graduate student who starts a quantum computing company, you're, at, you're, you're committing yourself to a path that is probably going to fail. And I think that for a lot of the existence of this company, there were multiple points of potential failure. So it's dangerous in that sense. But it's the kind of danger that explorers throughout history have taken on themselves because humans are driven to explore. We want to know, why is it that quantum mechanics says these things about the world? Is it true? Is it just a mathematical artifact? Or are there lurking right under our noses all of this immense wealth of beauty and knowledge and we just don't see it because our machines aren't there yet? So could we build that machine? Wouldn't that be exciting? Now, that is uh, a good thing to get your kind of guts excited. But of course, there's another thing going on here, which is that not only is this a fascinating thing, and I would claim, I think, with some support, that what we're embarking on now are some of the most interesting scientific tools that have ever been built. They're able to probe quantum mechanics in this level where it's big enough to not be exactly clearly quantum, but small enough to be tunable in quantum. It's in this sort of middle range. And people spend an awful lot of time answering questions about nature, building things like the Large Hadron Collider to think about things like the Higgs boson and things like that. This kind of machine does some of the same kinds of duty in our world. It's, it allows us to ask and answer questions about the fundamental nature of reality. But it does something else, and that's that these, this kneading the guts of the fundamental fabric of space-time allows you to solve problems that you couldn't otherwise solve, computational problems that matter, ones that are at the core of the reasons we don't have intelligent machines today. So over the last 10 years, I've been much less of a physicist and more of a computer scientist because this has become a subject that intensely fascinates me. Why don't we have intelligent machines now? And it turns out that the, machine, the problem that our system solves very well is the kind of problem that people like Google and Lockheed Martin and NASA have in spades. 
It's the, the core problem that they run their 50,000 CPU cycles on for years and years and years, trying to build better speech synthesizers or text-to-speech programs or object mm -hmm. recognition or other kinds of things that exhibit intelligent behavior. And uh, ultimately what I want to do is turn the power of this new kind of machine against that particular type of problem. Because if you can make inroads in that, the business opportunities are unbounded. The, the kind of paradigm shift that will come from the creation of intelligent machines of the sort that the intelligence that humans have uh, is, is, uh, is underappreciated how big of a difference it's going to be in the world. And I think 